1969, beginning of 1970. And from about 1970, 71 actually, in 1971 he was made the temple president and he was the president of New Vrindavan till 1986. Except for the new cow bar that Krishna Balaram Prabhu built two years ago, Everything that has ever been developed in New Vrindavan was between 1971 and 1986. Due to inconceivable reasons, Kulaji Prabhu had to leave, and practically the progress of the community came to a standstill. I can say that sincerely. When he was president of New Vrindavan, Prabhupada was so pleased with him that he would repeatedly say, quote unquote, Kuladri is expert at everything. <laughs> he loved Kuladri very dearly. He worked so hard, literally gave his life, his soul, his heart, his everything for the devotees of the community. 
And for all of us who were here at that time, we remember how Kulaji was like a father and a friend to us. He really protected the devotees, nourished the devotees. Despite inconceivable difficulties that were always upon us, he was literally a fearless leader who would be willing to do anything and everything for Prabhupada and the Vaishnavas. Haribo! And tomorrow we'll be listening to a tape of Srila Prabhupada and you'll hear Kalaji ask 24 questions in one lecture. <laughs> <laughs> he had that type of relationship with Srila Prabhupada. And during Srila Prabhupada's last months in this planet, Srila Prabhupada chose Kalaji Prabhu to be his personal servant for several months in Bombay and in Vrindavan. So what can I say? Kulajri Prabhu is expert at everything. And he is one of my very, very dearest friends. For several years I've been praying that he would participate again in the activities of Nubrindavan. And just three months ago, he agreed. Although he has a wife and six children, four of whom are in college, many expenses, many responsibilities in life. He was willing to accept the responsibility of President of Nubrindavan. When this was disclosed to the GPCs and leaders of the movement in Mayapur, they were ecstatic. Mm -hmm. Everyone felt New Vrindavan has hope once again. <laughs> There's actually a leader who knows what to do. So I'm really eternally grateful to Kalaji Prabhu for coming back to help all the Vaishnavas here and to fulfill the dream of Srila Prabhupada. At this time, we would like to request Kalaji Prabhu to speak to us. Kaladi Prabhu Ki! Jai! And glories to Shri Prabhupada. Jai! <clears throat> Why did you say that, Maharaj? Why are you putting me <laughs> <laughs> I have one, one more thing to say. <laughs> Tamal Krishna Maharaj, His Holiness, wrote a letter to us. He received a copy of Brijabhasi Spirit. On the front cover, Kulaji Prabhu was, there was a photo of him offering a fire yagya. Because he was in charge of all the fire yagyas in those days. He was in charge of so many things. And Kulaji Prabhu, or Srila Prabhupada looked at that photo and recognized Kulaji and pointed out to all the devotees just look and see what type of devotion Kulaji has. <laughs> if I had known you were going to say this, I would have been busy. <laughs> As the hope of the future, I would have been there trying, <laughs> trying to find something to manage. When I came to New Vrindavan, there were, we only had the Vrindavan farm. There were no other properties. <coughs> this, this property here is about a hundred acres. There was the temple room. There was a, a little shed out in the front. There was a barn. There was some one-room cabins that down the down the road, and Hayagriva Prabhu had an A-frame at the top of the hill. Then there were some. It was what we called the pig pen, and um, I think basically that was all there was. And 
Um, <clears throat> the service here, of course, was when was the deities and the cows. And uh, of course, the big. You have those photo. Oh, no, those photographs. You'll see the photographs. There was one big tree out in. The landscape's been changed, but Prabhupada would sit under that tree and speak to the devotees. You'll see the picture. And he would talk about New Vrindavan being uh, building seven temples on seven hills, the Goswami temples. So just like Vrindavan and cow protection and plain living and high thinking, just beginning to start discussing those things. Later he would develop into the Bhagavad Dharma discourses. In the first half of his movement he talked about book distribution and establishing temples around the world and the second half would be the culture of Krishna consciousness. So when I came, <clears throat> my service was taking care of the cows. Uh, Hayagriva Prabhu was teaching in Ohio, Ohio State, and he would come back and forth. <clears throat> and there were two or three couples, Bhagavad Ananda Prabhu, Jamini was here, Adi Patit Parmananda and his wife Satchabhama. So, um, those were the early days, they were <clears throat> Very simple prasad, just chant Hare Krishna. Less than a dozen people here. And uh, gradually it began to expand from that point. But Srila Prabhupada always talked about Nuvindavan as a, uh, <coughs> holy place of pilgrimage and changed a little bit how he envisioned our preaching would go in, uh, over the years. Uh, he came in 72, 74, and 76, after originally coming here in 69. Then after that, Radhamandam and Chandra were installed up here on this altar. <coughs> then when we purchased the Bahulaban farmhouse, uh, they were brought down there in the farmhouse for some time. They were worshipped. We installed them, we only had one outfit. Hmm. Then, but we had lots of cloth, so they would wrap the deities nicely every day. And then, <laughs> think, uh, because there were only one or two people who could sew at that time. Then, <clears throat> shortly after that, we built the extension on the farmhouse, the old farmhouse. And Radham and Damachandra then moved in there, and that's where Srila Prabhupada saw them in 72. <clears throat> that was the first. In Bombay, we had that, the no, 74, the string of songs was, was brought up. It was the first carved, you know, all the string of songs and all of this gone that are hand carved, the mystery in Bombay. Oh. That was his first piece. I met him in Boleshwar. He had everything carved, and Srila Prabhupada was coming for John Mosmi. And I came over to finish. I spent about a month. It was all done. I said, now let's, let's send it to New Vrindavan. And I asked him for the registration of his company, and his company was not registered. So in India, trying to export something hmm. without <clears throat> proper paperwork is a nightmare, more than a nightmare, almost impossible. <laughs> Plus, the donations that were given for the Sringasa came from within India, so we could not prove any income coming in. So, Radham and Damachandra began there. This is the way Radham and Damachandra work. I was explaining to someone, they, they will provide task and hurdle and challenge after challenge after challenge. Uh, that is, who was it who said, if you see the 
curved form of Krishna, do not see him because once you see him, Radhamandam and Chandra, um, Maharaj will explain their leela with the devotees who come and take shelter of them. You'll hear so many stories over the next couple of days. So that was getting the Sringasana. It came just a few days. And then Prabhupada, we remember when <coughs> Prabhupada took darshan of Radhamandam and Chandra, he turned and asked, how much was it? What <laughs> 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 the string is on. <laughs> and when he was, his words, uh, you know, it is not how much you pay, though, he said, it is uh, what you end up with. And he said it was, he was very pleased with what had been done. And so many. So many devotees came through, 72, 74, 76. Preaching was, uh, we had begun the palace in 74. Um, <clears throat> Prabhupada lived in a number of different places. He stayed upstairs in the attic here in 69. In uh, 72, he stayed at Madhavan. That building is not up anymore. 74, he stayed in what we called at that time the Gray House. If you look at where Tapapunja's garden is, there's that house. That used to be halfway between Radhamandam and Chandra's temple currently and the palace. It sat on the side of the road. And that's where Prabhupada stayed in 74. And in 76, Srila Prabhupada stayed in the house right at the bend where Sankirtan Prabhu now stays. Right as you turn to see the palace, that's where he stayed in 76. Um, and each one of those, I guess, we'll talk about more as the weekend goes on. And um, so many devotees were initiated at Nubandavan. Prabhupada had in front of Radhavan Chandra's temple at Bahuban, there was used to be a large patio, and uh, dozens and dozens of people were initiated there. Uh, then up on top of the hill we had a big uh, pandal, we call it pavilion, it was made. And we brought big Radha Vindavan Chandra up there, and Shishi Radha Damodar over there. And Prabhupada began the Bhagavad Dharma discourses from up there in the program. I remember Prabhupada was staying at the Madhuban house, old farmhouse, not even a bathroom. He used to have to go into the field, out into the woods. but he felt very at home there. And the reporter from the New York Times came to interview him at Madhubat. And I remember that a few of the GBC and Temple Presidents were there from New York and say, we try to get the New York Times to come and interview us about Krishna consciousness. We can't get them, but they come to the hills of West Virginia to interview <laughs> Prabhupada <laughs> for the New York Times. Prabhupada had a vision that this was an extraordinary place and had extraordinary potency. And by his mercy, we get a little service and try to try to do something to repay our debt, which we can never repay. And I, we compliment each other. He's, he's a great soul who can speak forever about Krishna. And I just try to help and be brief and try to keep busy. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> We could talk for hours, but uh, that all weekend. <coughs> no question. That uh, photo is that uh, just outside Ordenham or is that outside? That's Pahulava. What year was that? That had to be. 76. 76. 72, 74, and 76, Prabhupada would. <coughs> 
come and see Radha and Damachandra. Was it 72 when he was speaking for John Masmi? And it was midnight and everyone was falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you get, the dandas were all around the Vyasasan from the sannyasis and all the dandas. <laughs> <laughs> they were holding their dandas. And, so Prabhupada finally, by right about 12, 12 30, said, Enough. He was ready to speak all night on the appearance of Krishna. <laughs> How you came to New Vrindavan? Well, it, there, was, uh, there was a preaching party. I was uh, attending university at the time and uh, met devotees on campus, the university. Uh, they were from the Vrindavan, so I joined. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of my family, I walked away from my finishing my education, but I had a different education. <laughs> yeah, that's, they were. They sent. Devotees up to Pittsburgh, and I was at the university there on scholarship, and, and uh, came to New Vrindavan. <coughs> then, of course, New Vrindavan was going through changes, and there were householders here, and Kirtanandas at the time was in uh, traveling in India, and had come back, and Prabhupada wanted them to travel and preach to the university, so we started the road show, and went all over the country preaching at <coughs> universities. I did that for two, for a couple of years with the road show. And we, I was one of the managers and booking agents for the road show, and I would go to the university and convince them. At that time, they had a budget that they would, they would hire entertainment to entertain the students. So we had to go in, and of course we had, actually we used to have to hitchhike because we had no car. The road show made up of donated buses and we had, we can tell the story of Radha Damodar another time. We found the Radha Damodar, they were at the Washington Temple uninstalled. They later became Radha Damodar traveling party, but we took them from the closet in the Washington Temple and asked if we could travel with them. That's how they got their name, Radha Damodar, because we used to have to tie them in the bus to keep them from moving. <laughs> That's how Prabhupada gave them the name Radha Damodar. So this was that was started at New Vrindavan, and we were traveling around, and we would be in the north in the summertime and go to the universities in the south. We would head in the winter, and I would go ahead and book shows and try to convince the students that we did this, what we called it, an opera, a transcendental opera, transcendental rock opera, I think we called it, because the devotees would play contemporary music. Of course, I think the peak of that was when we booked in, a, in Pittsburgh, there was a big hall, I think it holds eight or 10,000 people, called the Syria Mosque. And we booked it and booked ads in the paper and on the radio and on the television. And during the play, the rock opera, there's a time in which a sannyasi comes in and begins to speak. There are these characters in the play. And there's music. Mangla Nanda Prabhu is coming to visit this summer. He wrote a number of the songs. Lord Chaitanya's Moon is Rising, wonderful songs. And at some point this person is questioning what is the purpose of life and those things and all of these songs complement the theme of preaching Krishna consciousness. And at some point a sannyasi comes in, Kirtananda, Vishnu Jan Swami, different Sudama at the time, Maharaj, different sannyasis would come in and preach to him. And it was incorporated in the show, not simply a lecture. But for our show in Pittsburgh, at that time in the show, Srila Prabhupada came up on the stage. Oh. Not only did he speak to the players, but the whole audience. And we had, I think, six, seven thousand people in the audience, yeah. which at that time was pretty wonderful. So that was probably the peak. And then shortly after that, Srila Prabhupada said to Kirtananda, we were doing, we were doing a show at Amherst in, in New England. And Srila Prabhupada was in L.A. and asked to come. So Kirtan and I got in a van, Shruti Kirti also at the time, who later became Prabhupada's servant. 
We drove across country in, in the van in two days. Anyway. Uh, when Prabhupada called, you, you got there as soon as you could get there. So then he said uh, that he wanted Kirtananda to leave the roadshow in the hands of Vishnajan and those, and he said, and come back and start to manage New Vrindavan. It was now important that we start accelerating the development of New Vrindavan. And uh, so that was 72, late 71, 72. And so that's when he came and you know, started to talk about the vision of developing New Vrindavan as a transcendental community, Bhagavad Dharma for the age of Kali, mm -hmm. cultural revolution, presentation of Krishna consciousness. Come on, Mars, that's enough. No. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Oh. What was your most challenging project in the Becoming Krishna conscious. <laughs> <laughs> it's ongoing. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, uh, I have to think, well, Tomorrow we'll, we'll continue, we'll, we'll add to that question and we'll answer more tomorrow. I think you just uh, saying this is the most exciting thing you find in, in your you and that one thing. <clears throat> exciting? Newman Dobbin was so dynamic <laughs> and extraordinary. Mm. I mean, a day. Uh, Of course, for me, the most exciting, everything re revolves around Srila Prabhupada because unlike some, I, I was very attached to his personality, his person, got to be with him on a number of occasions, serve him as his servant, and so I'm not as, those devotees who dedicate themselves to his instruction, they're great souls, and then there are the, there are us bungies who, whatever we can do, you know, we take whatever mercy we can get. But um, I would have to say that, in all honesty, the Vaishnavs that were there at this time, through the 70s and early 80s, there was such a, a, a bonding and, and inspiration that we all took from one another. I mean, everyone brought their peace to the Sankirtan party of New Vrindavan. Of course, Radhanath Maharaj had a very special piece, but uh, he will tell you, we could, we could talk about dozens of personalities. Um, you, the austerities that we, the commitment, uh, what we went through together, I don't see how we could have done it if, we, if there weren't this core of dedicated souls. And when you find such a group of people, your God brothers who are so focused and dedicated, you get inspiration and it becomes actually exciting. And it becomes inspiring. So there are, there's the external, there's the buildings, there's the attack by the demons, there's the <coughs> quarantine from disease, which was brought back from India by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things were external, but the but the relationships of the Vaishnavas, I have to say, is the, is what kept up, is what built New Vrindavan, and what uh, what is the most extraordinary thing. When you reciprocate with like-minded, dedicated souls, that's where you'll get your inspiration. At least that's where I putting up a building you can do, but putting it up with with Vaishnavas is. It's what makes the building special. Who were some of the core team members? <clears throat> well, of course, it went through some changes. Mars, you're not going to leave me. You know? okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a trick where you leave me with the microphone and you sneak out the back. <laughs> There were the early devotees here, and, and many of them left. But I would say, uh, seven, around 72, let me try and remember, and Maharaj 
you know, because of his renunciation, he can remember uh, my mind is going slowly. You know. uh, I would say that uh, there was uh, Bhagwanananda, of course, Kirtananda Swami was there, and he was pushing very hard. And at that time, he was a great inspiration by his personal example was extraordinary, and he had an extraordinary preaching ability. Um, there was Bhagwanananda Prabhu, very dynamic. Uh, art artist, very eccentric dude as well, hmm. and uh, and his wife Jamini, very dedicated. She used to write songs and teach children. Um, who else, Maharaj? There was Marsha. Uh, hmm? We knew him as Kashapa at the time. Mm -hmm. We'll use the old names and then we can come. Back. Um, yeah. And of course, there was one great soul that we all knew as, you may have, if you've read Bridge Bossy Spirit, you know, you, you've heard, read the article, the Prashadamatic. Yeah. <laughs> that was Taru Peru. Uh -huh. Taru was a great soul. One of our closest. God knows. Param Dhamma Prabhu. Uh, Param Brahma. Sorry. Param Brahma. Gargarishi. Um, yeah, so many. Yeah, Adoita Prabhu, Sudana Prabhu, um, Lajavati. And we had some extraordinary Mantajis at the time. Um, and your wife? Like, certainly Mother Katina. Yeah. If she put up with me, she's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> she's got to be extraordinary. <laughs> Um, just a few. Well, well, I think we'll name more as we as the weekend goes on, and they all had their part. And again, in the beginning, it was very simple. I mean, at one point, there was there had to be a decision made. When we started the palace, uh, there was the quarantine at that time, and I took the plans to Srila Prabhupada in Mayapur. I was not in the quarantine. I had left before they had closed the place down and surrounded it because of the hepatitis. So I didn't have to stay. Uh, I w so I went to the Mayapur festival and showed Prabhupada the plans to his palace. And he turned to me and we were going over the plans and he said, everywhere in the world they are building temples. We are building temples for Krishna. He said, but at New Vrindavan you are building a palace for me. He said, that is he said, that is a true understanding of our philosophy, uh, to worship the spiritual master. <clears throat> uh, before Krishna. <clears throat> so, um, so the decision had to be made when Prabhupada <laughs> preached and his vision and his early instructions were to create a self-sufficient cow protection type of village with seven temples like Vrindavan. But when we started the palace, and as we continued to develop, it became very evident that very few people can live that kind of a lifestyle. And then the palace started becoming prominent, and people were visiting, and we were getting large groups of people. Then the idea of the North American, North American pilgrimage site for Krishna consciousness for Indians in the Western Hemisphere, so the idea of a simple village, self-sufficient, or a major preaching project, and that was a crossroads. And so now we try to balance both, but obviously you can see the structure, the infrastructure was created as a preaching uh, facility, a preaching project, to be more than... I mean, of course, if you can present a pure village of Vrindavan for cow protection, that would be extraordinary. But not simply that, now we have this other identity. So we're, even I've only been back a couple months and trying to balance exactly what the identity, what our vision will be for the future. Maharaj is going to be here for a month and I plan to spend time talking with him and get from him an understanding so that we can go forward. Now's enough. <laughs> There are
thousands of devotees who at one time have been living in Vrindavan. <clears throat> and the impact of New Vrindavans upon the international society that Srila Prabhupada founded has historically had a tremendous impact. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> this year, the biggest event in the entire world took place. The Kumbha Mela at Prayag. According to national government statistics, there was approximately 30 million people that attended. <clears throat> And one of the camps that had the best press coverage and just hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people that visited was the ISKCON camp. There were thousands of religious organizations there. In fact, Srila Prabhupada said that the prestige of any religious organization in India is determined by how they present themselves at Kumbha Mela. Yeah. Yeah. There was hundreds of devotees from all over the world who came to help. It was really a wonderful joint effort. So there was a temple tent at the Kumbha Mela. It was in the heart of the project. And I want to offer my obeisances and to my great satisfaction, I saw the presiding deities of the Kumbha Mela was Sri Sri Radha Vrindavan Chandra from New Vrindavan. Years ago, they made a cast mold of the deities. And you'll see tomorrow at Bahulaban, that cast mold will be there, presiding over our festival tomorrow. And the exact deities were there at Kumbha Mela, being worshipped by millions of people as the deities of Iskan. Hare Krishna. New Vrindavan began in 1968. Kirtan Ananda Swami Maharaj and Hayagriva Prabhu were searching for a place to begin a farm community because they knew that that was one of the very, very great desires of Srila Prabhupada. They found it was very difficult because they had no money. And to buy land is not easy without money. <laughs> but they found in a uh, underground counterculture newspaper called the San Francisco Oracle, a small ad that there was a hundred acres for a very, very, a lease of only 99 years for $99 for anyone who had a spiritual purpose in West Virginia. So they came to the place. They had to walk up a muddy road about three miles, four miles to get here. And this was the place that they had. It was about 120 acres. After some time, they wrote to Srila Prabhupada. In fact, they went to Montreal, Canada, where Srila Prabhupada was. <clears throat> and they personally surrendered and offered New Vrindavan to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That was in 1968. And Srila Prabhupada promised he would come to teach them how to make New Vrindavan a place of pilgrimage. Oh. So it was on May 21st, 1969, that Srila Prabhupada first placed his lotus feet upon this holy land. Previously, he was in Columbus, Ohio. There he met the very famous um, counterculture poet, Allen Ginsberg. And also he had a 
lecture at the Hitchcock Hall of Ohio State University. About 2,000 students attended. Prabhupada began the kirtan, and when he got up to dance, all 2,000 students got up to dance. The kirtan went on for several hours. Srila Prabhupada was so happy. The students were dancing on their seats, dancing on their desks, dancing everywhere. <laughs> he wrote to his leaders all over the world and told them that the student community of America is very receptive to Krishna consciousness. They love to chant Hare Krishna, they love to dance, and of course they also love prasad. <laughs> I believe from Columbus, Ohio, he went to Athens, Ohio, where Ohio University is, where there's some devotees living. And from there he came to New Vrindavan. When they got to the road, which was later called Agasura, <clears throat> because it devoured any vehicle that tried to go into it. <laughs> It's a wonderful story, but the devotees took Srila Prabhupada and about two miles from this, temp from this farm that we're sitting now, the car broke down, it got stuck, could not go any further. So Srila Prabhupada just got out and started walking. <clears throat> so it was about a two mile walk Srila Prabhupada was leading the way, along with Kirtananda Swami, Hayagriva, and some other devotees. And at one point, Srila Prabhupada stopped. The devotees put a little cloth down for him to sit on. And he said, we are stopping because Kirtananda is tired. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came up. And this is what he saw. At that time, this building was different. Where this pillar is in the ceiling, that was the end of the house. Mm. This section here was built to expand. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, the altar was up to where the fireplace begins. And from there to here was the pujari room, and in the back was the kitchen. It had a mud floor. Hmm. And Srila Prabhupada saw they were putting cow dung on the floor. He was very happy. He said, it is just like the villages of India. Hmm. The outside of the temple looked nothing like it is now. It has been in the late, nine, late 80s. This temple has been really, really renovated, both inside and out. <clears throat> in those days, it was so beat up due to neglect. It was a farmhouse over a hundred years old. And Srila Prabhupada, when he came, he was so happy. There was a barn here, and there was just a pig pen and a chicken coop <laughs> from the previous owners. Mm -hmm. That was New Vrindavan. They brought Srila Prabhupada upstairs. We'll see that room. And there he took out his deities of Radha and Krishna, small brass deities, and made a little altar for them. He had two trunks where he kept all of his belongings. He made that into a desk and sat on the floor next to it. And he was all set up to reside in Nuvrindavan. Upstairs, Srila Prabhupada lived. One part of the room was like a darshan hall where he would meet people. He would also go and he would translate his books throughout the night. And the other place he would rest. He would come down here to the temple room and give class every morning and every evening to the few devotees that were here. Srila Prabhupada was just so happy here. It was such a simple environment. At that time, 
I believe there was one cow. Her name was Kalia. She was a very small cow with one eye. Hmm. She was black with some white spots. Very gracious, beautiful cow. But you have to have the eyes to appreciate her. Srila Prabhupada would drink her milk every day, morning, noon, and evening. And Srila Prabhupada was so happy. He blessed Kaliya. He proclaimed to the devotees that Kaliya's milk was the best quality milk he had drunk in 65 years. Oh. And as far as his prasad, obviously this place was so desolate. There was no way to get fresh fruits or fresh vegetables. So they just would cook uh, chapatis, rice and dal. And there was a weed that grew here called pokeweed. And that weed the devotees discovered was edible. <clears throat> and it grew quite profusely. So the devotees would make pokeweed sabji, pokeweed pakoras, <laughs> pokeweed chutney, <laughs> pokeweed paratas, <laughs> many pokeweeds. <laughs> and Prabhupada loved the pokeweed. He loved it because it grew naturally at New Vrindavan. To him this was very important because he wanted to stress self-sufficiency, being satisfied with what Krishna is providing from the land that you live on. And of course there were no toilets. Prabhupada would go with his little lota down the hill to respond to nature's calls and they set up a little place for him to bathe. Sometimes the devotees would heat up the water for him. The cooking was all done on wood. They would go into the forest and chop down trees. Srila Prabhupada stayed here for one month oh. until June 23rd. Every day in the afternoons and early evenings he would sit out under a persimmon tree. That tree is still there. We'll show you later. There, he would write letters to his disciples. He preferred no tractors, no machines. Very simple life. Just depending on Krishna and depending on what nature provides. He explained that this was very necessary to be a model for the world to see. Because modern technology is polluting the environment and so much distracting people's minds away from Krishna. It's a life of passion and ignorance. He wanted New Vrindavan to, to reveal to the world a civilization of pure goodness, of pure devotion. He felt that cow protection was very, very important because Srila Prabhupada explained to us that one of the main reasons there's so much suffering and conflict in the world is due to the karmic reaction of the torture and slaughter of innocent cows who are so dear to Lord Krishna. And economically, the entire culture is so unstable. It could collapse at any second because it's not based on real wealth. Real wealth is land and cows, not paper and metal. Srila Prabhupada described to us how uh, if we protect the cows nicely at New Vrindavan and very much attach ourselves to hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, then Radha Vrindavan or Radha Krishna will bless us and provide all opportunities and all opulences for devotional service. That was his faith. It was here at Vrindavan that Srila Prabhupada also said that we should establish this as a holy place of pilgrimage for the Western world. He wanted us to begin by constructing the seven major temples of Vrindavan. 
He considered that a beginning. And he told us which temples. The temple of Rupa Goswami, Radha Govindaji. Temple of Sanatan Goswami, Madan Mohan. Jiva Goswami's Radha Damodar, Madhu Pandit Goswami's Radha Gopinath, Raghunathas Goswami's Radha Giridhari, Shamananda Goswami's Radha Sham Sundar, and Lokanath Goswami's Radha Gokulananda Radha Vinod. Prabhupada also wanted us to excavate mm. the holy places of Krishna's pastimes at New Vrindavan and make it such a wonderful place of pilgrimage that devotees from all over the Western world could come here for festivals, could come here for shelter. He also wanted New Vrindavan to be a place where all classes of men and women in human society could come here to see the positive alternative of a Krishna conscious life of simple living and high thinking. Srila Prabhupada considered that New Vrindavan was one of the most essential and important projects in his mission to his Guru Maharaj. That throughout the world people will be distributing books, explaining the perfection of life. But New Vrindavan was to exemplify a culture based on those books. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada wanted schools for the children here. He said, you learn them math, you teach them arithmetic, you teach them language and writing. He explained the subjects they should be taught, but it should all be done in a spirit of service to Krishna. In fact, in one time Srila Prabhupada said, at New Vrindavan, the most important subject for all the children is this is Krishna and this is Balaram and this is the cows. <laughs> <laughs> So during that month that Srila Prabhupada resided here, he planted the seed, which was a great dream that he had. And the few devotees here took that, that dream as their life and soul to build New Vrindavan. Soon the first winter came, and almost everybody left. <laughs> In those days, there was hardly water. Devotees would have to climb down a mountain to a place in a valley where there's a small waterfall and a soft, small creek of water. They named it Keshi Ghat. <laughs> and then they'd have to climb back up. And by the time they climbed the mountain, they were all full of dirt anyway. But the bathing purified them. Srila Prabhupada left this place to go to Los Angeles. And when he left, he left a life mission for many devotees who are embracing that even today. New Vrindavan has always been a place, as I said, where very intense experiences manifested. <clears throat> in 1970, Srila Prabhupada <clears throat> gave sannyas to four of his disciples. That was in Los Angeles. Later he went to Japan and devotees from all over America came to New Vrindavan for Janmashtami and for Prabhupada's Vyas Puja. Even though New Vrindavan was just this little farm on this old hill, it was the place of pilgrimage for America. There were literally hundreds of devotees that came from all the temples in the East Coast, even people from California, San, uh, Albuquerque, and thousands of miles they came walking up that muddy road to this little place. All there was was the farmhouse. That was a very historical incident. It was one of the major crises <coughs> in the history of ISKCON. 
these four sannyasis were preaching to all the other innocent devotees that each and every one of us have committed a dastardly, horrible offense to Srila Prabhupada because he is God. He is Krishna himself incarnated within this world and we fail to recognize him. We fail to respect him for who he is and what he is. Therefore, we are destined to suffer miserably. And until we change our attitude and worship him as the Supreme Lord, there's nothing we can do to atone for our offenses. And all these poor devotees came for a festival. <laughs> Someone said, we should just chant Hare Krishna. He, they said, no, your chanting of Hare Krishna will have no effect because you have offended God. And it would be a greater disgrace for us to just be happy here chanting Hare Krishna and eating prasad. We have to atone. We have to repent. These poor devotees were suffering miserably. Their hearts were broken. They were confused. At that time, Srila Prabhupada only had a few books. The first three volumes of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. I think Nectar of Devotion had just come. But the devotees were so busy, very few of them have actually applied their minds to really studying his books. So when these sannyasis, who were very powerful people, were speaking, no one could stand up and argue against them. Some of the devotees accepted it as true and just felt miserable, practically suicidal for the offense they had committed. Others just didn't know whether it was true or not. They were completely confused. These sannyasis were preaching in this very temple room that we're sitting now that Srila Prabhupada had totally rejected all of us. Because of our offenses, he has rejected us. That's why he left America. That's why he's in Japan now. He's gone to India because he cannot tolerate us any longer. This was worse than death to his disciples. But just previous to this, Prabhupada saw that this type of mentality was growing. So he established a GBC body of 12 devotees. And I agree with Prabhu, who was a Grihasta, <clears throat> and some of the other leaders were here. They wrote an emergency letter to Srila Prabhupada. Perhaps it was a telegram to Japan and explained what was happening. And Srila Prabhupada, after days of this torture, he wrote back. Mm. And Hayagriva Prabhu read it to all the devotees. Prabhupada wrote, My dear sons and daughters of New Vrindavan, yeah. please accept my blessings. Yeah. And he explained how pleased he was by the um, devotional efforts of all of the devotees. And just those words just alleviated the pain of everybody's heart. Prabhupada says we're still his sons and daughters. He's given us his blessings. He's pleased with us. That means whatever these sannyasis are saying is bogus. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada was very strong that the spiritual master is never God. The spiritual master is the eternal servant of God. But because he's serving God, he is to be given the honor of God. But still, he teaches us pure love and devotion to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. And it was soon after that that Srila Prabhupada established his Pranam Mantra. Namaste, Saraswati Devi, Gauravani Pracharani, Nirvishesha Shunyavani, Paschata Deshatarani. That he was a disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And he had come to the Western world especially to relieve the people of the great burden of impersonalism and voidism. In 
fact, Srila Prabhupada proclaimed that those four sannyasis, because they're impersonalists, they're speaking an impersonal philosophy, he said, this is a disease that will destroy our whole society. They should not be allowed in any temple. They should reject this impersonalism, accept my teachings, study his books. And he said, they should travel and preach, but not come to any temples or disturb any devotees. Mm -hmm. You know, when these devotees got this message, they repented. And it's actually a wonderful thing, because in their repentance, they traveled all over America and opened wonderful centers. And when Srila Prabhupada saw that they were preaching the right thing, and he accepted them back within their society. That was on Janmashtami of 1970.